hear me. Um, first and foremost, uh, welcome to all of you on behalf of CALP. My name is Martin Pittman, and I'm the Global Capacity Building Coordinator. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. Um, perhaps Steph or someone can let me know if you can't hear me. All right, thanks, Steph. Great, thank you. We appreciate that you've taken the time from your duties to participate in this webinar, and we hope that our presentation and discussion will foster among you the same enthusiasm that we have for the new materials and for the impending rollout in the field. As you know, CALP has been in a phase, in a phase of strategizing, planning, and preparation during the last year. And for the capacity building team, that has culminated in an updated strategy and a range of new modules and courses. I'd like to acknowledge the hard work of the capacity building team, of the leadership within CALP, and the contributions of a wide range of the community of practice. Specifically, too, the core materials that we will discuss were developed by teams from Red R and the Fritz Institute in close conjunction with CALP. The materials have benefited from review and input from members of the TAG and from pilot workshops, including three hosted by the Lebanon CAF Consortium. We've allocated just over one hour for this discussion, and we'll do our best to monitor and honor that time. Both Steph Roberson, CALP's technical team project manager, and I will be presenting, and benefiting from the support of Giselle Miguin, the D digital communications officer. We invite you to submit questions and comments in the chat box as we go along, and we'll aim to respond within our presentations when feasible or during the question portion of the discussion. You may also opt to raise your hand if appropriate. Lastly, to limit background noise and perhaps to improve the connection, I ask that you mute your microphone when not speaking. Thanks. Without further ado then, let me allow me to present the agenda for our time together. As you can see, there's six sections. Uh, the first is just to take a look back at what we've been able to do so far in terms of capacity buildings uh, capacity building reach for CALP over the over recent years, and then give a bit of a background to the review of the materials, and, and then provide an overview of our new training offer and learning pathways, then move into a bit more of the uh, logistics and setup for training delivery and rollout, uh, and then to give an overview of a new learning management system, which will greatly enhance access to our capacity building materials. And then finally, of course, to give some time for questions and a bit of discussion. So at this point, I'll, I'll hand it over to Steph to talk a little bit about how we've been able to have some reach thus far. Great. Thank you, Martin. Um, can I just check if people can hear me? There's a little at the top. You should have a little button of, with a picture of a man raising his hand. If you guys could click on that, maybe give me a smiley face or a thumbs up, agree. That's great. OK, I can see lots of people can hear me. Fantastic. Thanks. OK, I'm very briefly going to now um, just run through some of our uh, data from the numbers that we reached in the last year in 2016 um, so that you guys can get a sense of what CALP has been doing before we move into what we're going to do next. Um, for a face-to-face -face training, we have data from 2015 and 2016, and as you can see here, um, we have delivered slightly fewer trainings in 2016 compared to 2015, uh, so 40 this year and 46 last year, but our attendance, the number of people who attended was much higher, which indicates to us that uh, obviously more people are, are keen on attending trainings um, and that we're getting more people per training than we were previously. Um, so that's just a bit of interesting facts about our face-to-face -face training that we've been delivering in the past. Uh, most of those were probably CALP level 2 trainings, but also markets trainings and some of our other face-to-face other -face materials. So overall, uh, you can see in this table that um, we have in the first column the numbers of people we reached in 2016 only, and then some cumulative data where we have it for previous years. We don't always have numbers that go back. Um, but you can see uh, across here that not only have a lot of people been attending our webinars, but also viewing them on uh, YouTube afterwards. So we're hoping to make a point of recording more of our uh, webinars so that we can 
create wider access to those things. Um, and as you can see, we've reached a lot more people with e-learning this year compared to previous years because calc has been focusing a bit more on developing and delivering uh, e-learning online training. Um, so that's, that's sort of how many people we've reached in the last year. Cumulatively, you can see it's about 7,800 people in 2016, which we're pretty proud of, I have to say. <laughs> um, and then something that may be of interest to a lot of you, particularly capacity building people, is uh, who's doing our learning. Now, this is based on data from uh, Disaster Ready only, um, where they ask for when people register to sort of list where, where they're coming from. So we have some interesting data on which types of organizations, types of people are attending training. Um, just to say on this data that the Red Cross, Red Crescent number is much lower than the real number because obviously uh, some of our training is also on the Red Cross, Red Crescent uh, website. So if you factor in that data, the numbers for the Red Cross jumps up significantly as well. Um, but we haven't used that here. So this is just something of interest uh, for you guys to see in terms of who's, who's reaching and accessing our learning at the moment. Um, and now I'm going to pass back over to uh, Martin to give you a bit of background on why we changed our materials. Mute ton micro. Great. Thanks, Steph. Uh, and it is exciting to see the, the growth in the number of people accessing the, our workshops, and particularly thanks to the e learning and you'll, you'll see that we're making a commitment to, to respond to that interest as well. So as we moved into this period of uh, reflection and strategizing, we undertook a concentrated review of our materials and our processes of the past and it led to the four key observations that you see now. First of all, the need to uh, update and expand our materials and content. Uh, the importance of acknowledging and targeting different roles within cash transfer programming to be sure that people who have particular responsibilities are supported in ways that really uh, respond to those responsibilities rather than simply being a, an overarching uh, form of capacity building. Uh, third, the importance of going beyond just individual capacity building and thinking about what are what's institutional capacity and how can organizations strengthen their, their organizational ability to uh, deliver cash transfer programming. And then, of course, similar to the, the observation about e-learning, the needs to diversify the means of practitioners to access uh, capacity building opportunities. So how have those played themselves out in terms of our, our new work and moving forward? Uh, first, we our strategy is uh, predicated on a capacity building theory of change and competence framework, and I'll, I'll show those uh, in just a moment. Uh, and then we've also been revising our standard training package, and we now identify three different practitioner groups, uh, people from uh, strategic personnel such as decision makers uh, and planners, technical people uh, involved in program design and monitoring, and then lastly, operations people uh, focused pr particularly on implementation. We've also been in the process of developing a range of specialized courses to complement our standard training package for individuals. Um, we have articulated a learning pathway that guides practitioners through a series of, of uh, capacity building opportunities. Uh, additionally, we've developed tools and processes to help organizations improve their capacity to design and deliver quality cash transfer programming. And then, of course, we're investing in e-learning opportunities. Here's the capacity building theory of change, and I'll, I'll not spend a lot of time on this because, as you can see, there's a, uh, an email address on, on CALP's website where you can take a look at the theory of change, and Steph has just put that into the chat box for you to click on. But in essence, we have articulated an overall outcome uh, at the top of the theory of change and then identified a series of inputs that ultimately uh, inform our activities, leading to short-term outcomes and long-term outcomes that contribute to the overall outcome. So we encourage you to take a look at that and to know that uh, the capacity building strategy activities are really based on that theory of change. 
Next is the competence framework. This is showing just one uh, page of a competence framework to give you a sense of the structure of it. And again, that's available on CALP's website as well. Um, I think Stefan's going to put a link in there for you to see as well. Um, there are a range of uh, areas. You can see there, number one is the core humanitarian principles. And within that, that uh, sector, there are not sector, an area, there are three competence areas. Uh, humanitarian context, humanitarian principles and standards, beneficiary accountability, and community participation. And then the next column you'll see is essential competence. Basically what we do there is we articulate, well, what are the, what's the, the essential skills that everybody involved in cash transfer programming needs within that, what, that competence area? So there's some bullets identified there. The, the remaining three columns are those three practitioner groups that I just mentioned before of operations, uh, technical, and strategic. And what those boxes do is it says, okay, if someone works in operations, are there any additional competences that they need above those essential competencies in terms of delivering cash transfer programming? And that's what the, those columns are for. In, in this uh, competence area. There aren't significant differences, but as you were to, as you would look through, you would see that there are uh, areas where particular uh, practitioner groups have skills that may necessary skills that perhaps the other ones do not have. Again, I'd encourage you to take a look at that through the the CAP website and let us know if you have any questions or advice. I think what we can do now is switch back. I think I'll, Steph is going to take this to give a bit of the, oh no, I'm sorry, I think I will do this, um, to share a little bit of the structure of our capacity building strategy. As I showed before in the theory of change, we've articulated the outcome at the top of the screen. And then we have, I'll focus on the two columns on the right in the blue. Um, we divide our capacity building work into two components. The first is the individual capacity building, and the second is strengthening institutional capacity. We also refer to that as institutionalization. Perhaps many of you have heard that. Okay. Focusing on the individual capacity building, uh, we have three areas that we're really investing time and resources. And the first is the standard training package. And again, we're going to go into more detail on that. Um, that's similar to what many of you may be familiar with, with what we've done in the past uh, of, being, of providing workshops to a wide range of practitioners to build uh, their capacity. We are also in the process of developing a uh, focused building individual expertise program for practitioners that really want to go deeper into developing uh, comprehensive skills related to CTP. And that program is being designed in collaboration with CashCap, uh, with whom CALP has uh, carried out a pilot over the last year. So we're in, in discussion of, of the design of that program at this point. And then we offer uh, online and self-directed learnings in ways that we haven't in the past. Right? So that focuses on our areas of individual capacity building. Within institutionalization, we have three areas. The first is that we've developed a, a tool called the Organizational Capacity Assessment Tool, the OCAP is what we call it now. It's possible that you'll be hearing about that with a new name. Uh, we're considering revising the name. But in any case, that's a tool that allows organizations to self-assess where they are in terms of uh, uh, areas that, that would enhance their ability to design and deliver quality cash transfer program. And there's a range of uh, skills areas or organizational development capacity areas within the, the tool. And uh, they're able to use that tool to see where they are and to articulate out an action plan. The Strengthening Institutional Capacity Program is really the process that we encourage organizations to go through to, to use the OCAT 
in a very deep way of developing an, uh, an, an action plan and actually considering ways of allocating resources that are going to truly make a difference in terms of cash transfer programming. It might be to update some standard operating procedures of an organization. It might be related to um, further training for some of the staff members. It might be creating new positions or creating advocacy, things along those lines. Uh, that's a process that we've articulated and are providing, uh, will be providing guidance to organizations as they're aiming to, to move beyond just the assessment associated with the tool, but we're really trying to take action. Lastly, we, we continue to see regional learning for uh, as an opportunity for uh, practitioners and organizations at the regional level to come together to discuss burning issues. And to us, that's really an opportunity for, for institutions and organizations to share experiences that end up supporting uh, cash transfer programming overall. Okay. Jumping back to the, the column on the left, the quality CTP training materials, that's really the commitment that CALP has to being sure that we have materials that are responsive to and appropriate for the, the community of practice. And so we've articulated that as one of our strongest commitments within our current strategy period. Uh, again, a big highlight of that is the online learning management system that Steph will be speaking of a little bit further. So that's, that's the background and how we got to, to where we are now. So, so I'll hand back over to Steph and invite her to talk a bit about the, our learning pathways and the new materials. Great. Thanks, Martin. Um, I'm hoping everybody can still hear me. <laughs> I hope I've remembered to unmute properly. Um, so we're going to talk about our new learning pathways and our new materials and how they are structured. Uh, many of you, I think, will be familiar with the previous CALP training materials, which were known as Level 1 and Level 2. The Level 1, I think, was, was initially converted into a, a short online training called Intro to Cash, and then the Level 2 is a five-day training that, in the past, we've rolled out. So these new materials that we're presenting to you will effectively be replacing those older materials. So these are an update, but also a, a bit of a restructure of those materials. Um, so, uh, we've got this uh, great diagram uh, which tries to outline how we've structured and uh, created and moved these materials forward. Uh, so in column one, you'll see two things there. There's the fundamentals and introduction to market analysis. The introduction to market analysis is an e-learning that was developed uh, with CALP and IRC, and that's a 30-minute, uh, very brief introduction to basic markets. And then the fundamentals course, this is, uh, we have it as a one-day face-to-face training. Uh, we're also in the process of converting it into an e-learning. Um, so we hope once that's converted into an e-learning, it will be open access to all, and it will replace the previous Intro to Cash course that was available online. Um, so both of those are, are publicly available. They're free. They're online. Um, and anybody can do them effectively. Um, in column two, this is really our core skills on cash package. And these trainings have been designed to, those three there that you can see are designed to replace the previous CALP level two. As Martin explained, uh, we found that the level two wasn't, was no longer suitable because it didn't target different audience, audience, uh, sorry, audiences. Um, so we have designed these packages around our competence framework and the articulation of those three participant groups which is planning and decision-making, which is more strategic senior management level. Um, and that course is currently a two-day face-to-face course. Technical design and quality core is really for our program staff that's aimed at uh, food security, livelihood staff, but also WASH, shelter, education, healthcare, any program staff who are uh, designing and implementing uh, programs. And then the operations core, which has been uh, designed in conjunction with uh, the Fritz Institute um, and is based on largely uh, finance and logistics, but also with some elements of IT and security. So those are the types of audiences that those cash trainings have been designed for. The technical and the operations core are both currently five-day trainings, um, and the 
planning and decision making core is a two day training. So at the moment, all three of those packages are face to face only. Um, and in order to access one of those core packages, uh, the courses in column one will act as a prerequisite. So in future, instead of applying for a CALP Level 2 course, people might apply for either any one of those three core courses. And we would ask that they have done the fundamentals and the introduction to markets as a prerequisite. The reason for that is it allows us to level off the amount of knowledge that we have in the room. We often find when delivering face-to-face -face training, there's a mix of knowledge and skills in the room. And it can be quite difficult to tailor a training for that group, with some people having quite a bit of knowledge and other people completely new. So those two prerequisite courses will enable us to ensure that everybody starts the core with a basic level of knowledge. Um, now, we're aware that obviously some people might need to do a core course who already have quite a higher level of skills and experience and don't want or need to sit through several hours of e-learning. So what we're planning to do is to have a test out option. So if somebody wants to apply for a core course, uh, but they don't feel that they need to do the fundamentals, they could take a test. And if they score a particular score or higher, they would be then allowed to move forward and apply for the core. If their score is too low, we would then make them go back and actually do the course to really check that they've understood that knowledge um, in that course. So that's how we're envisaging those two uh, interlinking and working with each other. Under column three, you'll see the practical application exercises. That's something that we're uh, drafting and developing at the moment, so they're not currently available. The idea of those exercises is that they would largely be self-study or self-taught. So they might be online exercises that you work through by yourself. They might be uh, printed case studies that you would read through with workbooks. Um, there could be a number of uh, exercises in there. The purpose of column three there is not to present new learning or new information, but to allow people to practice the skills that they learned in modules one and two. So that is a space to allow people to then go in into a scenario and practice their skills, make decisions, be given, a, be given a context and a situation and be asked, OK, what do you do here? How will you handle this? Um, and so that's really what this practical application section is all about. Um, modules 1, 2, and 3 make up, as you can see in this diagram, CALP's new standard package. So people don't have to work through the whole package. You can just access the fundamentals or the online training. You can jump straight to the practical exercises. Um, however, if you want a more structured approach to your learning, you could follow a pathway, which means that you could do these things in order as part of a learning approach and a pathway approach. So there'll be a bit more information on that when we launch our actual learning pathways online a bit later on. But this gives you a sense of the types of courses you might be able to do or how you could access them. And in the final column, column four, we have our specialized modules. Those sit separately outside of the standard package. Specialized modules are really advanced courses that will cover a range of technical topics. And those courses can be done standalone. You don't have to have done a standard package in order to do those. Um, you can access them at any time. But some of those courses may require a certain amount of knowledge. So to give you some examples, we have a markets tools assessment training, which is currently a five-day face-to-face training. In order to access that training, um, you would not necessarily need to have done a full technical core or a, any of our core courses. But you might need to have done the introduction to markets online. You may need to have done the fundamentals that might help with that course. Uh, similarly, we have a couple of online courses we're developing now, which are on uh, CTP and social protection. And that's a very advanced technical topic. So we have made an assumption that people who want to take that course have a basic knowledge of how cash programs work uh, before trying to attempt integrating that into a social protection scheme. So some of these courses will clearly state um, from the, from the get-go whether or not you need uh, knowledge preceding doing that course. Um, and thank you. Martin has just put a link down there to our course catalog. You can read all of the courses on that page and link to, for each of those courses, you can find out the learning objectives, who is it targeting, who's the course for, and whether it's online or face-to-face, -face and how you can access that. Um, Martin, can I just ask, did I forget to cover anything on the learning pathways before we move on? 
No, but I will uh, point to one question that I can respond to. Karen asked if we have plans to put any of the, the core uh, modules in column two as part of e-learning. And there is a hope to ultimately do that. As you can imagine, a five-day course being converted to e-learning takes a lot of time and resources. Uh, um, so it may be some time before that's available. Plus, the other reality is that Calp is Calp still Calp sees the face-to-face -face trainings as a real networking opportunity and an important uh, way of building the community of practice. So I don't necessarily see us trying to shift away from those face-to-face -face opportunities. But at the same time, there is real value in uh, providing access via e-learning. So that's, that's a direction that we're moving, but uh, it may take some time before we have any of the core modules uh, uh, up on e-learning. Great. Thanks for that's clarifying it. that, Martin. And maybe I could just add, Karen, as well. With those, with those core courses, because they are both long, as Martin mentioned, and quite technical and involve often a need for people to ask questions. Um, rather than converting it into e-learning per se, one of the options we're considering at the moment is converting those courses into sort of facilitated webinars where you might sign up for a period of 10 weeks and do one webinar a week that covers the course content. Um, so we feel that those courses at the moment might still need to be facilitated rather than self-studied. Um, but but it, yeah, it's something we're still we're still figuring out and looking into at the moment. Um, and I can see a few other questions. Let's just have a quick look. Um, okay, Frederick has a very good question. Must one take the new curriculum if they've already done the initial? Um, do, uh, Fred, I don't know if you're referring to the um, the existing e-learning or a CALP Level 2. Um, these courses are really an update of the Level 2. Um, if you've already done a Level 2, you wouldn't necessarily need to retake a core, but you might want you might be interested in some of the the updates that are in there. For example, just to just to maybe explain a bit more, if you were to take the technical core course, um, it does cover quite a few of the same things that Level Two did, but we've updated it to incorporate more information on multi-sector and multi-purpose cache. We've restructured it so that instead of structured around the project cycle, that course is structured around the OECD DAC quality criteria. Um, so that is a different way of, of phrasing and framing that information. Um, so the course is actually quite different from the level two, although it covers a lot of the same core concepts, uh, if that makes sense. If you've already done level two, you wouldn't necessarily need to retake it, but you might be interested in. Um, Jude, yes, there will be a TOT, and we are planning. We're, we're going to move into the rollout in a minute, so I'll let Martin talk about how we're planning to roll this out. Um, Jenny? Uh, yes, we're going to talk about how we're going to roll out these materials and who will have access to them shortly. Um, so let me just jump to, sorry, just reading the questions now. <laughs> um, so Frederick, to answer your question, if you have, uh, if you do the fundamentals and the introduction to markets, those things in column one, you don't have to then immediately take a face-to-face -face training, you could then easily access our specialized courses or other online options. So the learning pathways are optional. They're not, uh, you wouldn't be forced. But in order to, in order to access the technical, uh, sorry, the module two core courses there in that second column, you would need to have either done the two prerequisites or taken the test as an alternative to that. I hope that's, um, that's clear. Um, let me move, let me pass back over to Martin to talk about the rollout next. I think that's what we have coming up. Steph, and thanks for all the questions. Go ahead and keep them coming, and we'll try to be responding as we go or uh, uh, at the end of the presentation. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, plan delivery and rollout. Okay, and CALP sees three types of uh, delivery models, uh, and this is particularly for the face-to-face -face workshop that, that speaking of. And I'll discuss these this way through this structure and hopefully bring in some of the questions that, that have already come up and add some additional information. Um, there's three types of uh, 
workshops that we anticipate. The first is a kelp-led workshop where kelp organizes and pre-finances all aspects of a workshop um, and then recovers costs via registration fees. In this case, kelp, we have the responsibility of, of providing or finding a trainer and facilitator. We're the ones who organize the venue and do the advertising and things along those lines. Very similar to the public workshops that we've had in the past that you've been able to see on the, the CALP uh, training calendar on our website. Um, we will continue to have registration fees in order to help us cover our, our costs. It's not a, a significant profit opportunity for CALP, but rather it really does just focus on the costs of the, the workshops. Um, we are updating those uh, registration fee rates. Uh, they are probably, they're expected to be slightly higher than what we have right now over the past year, but not significantly. Um, and so hope, we hope to, to still be responsive to the community of practice in terms of, in terms of costs. Um, a CALP affiliated workshop is one where it's organized and financed by, a mem by an external entity, such as a CALP member organization or perhaps a training partner organization. In a situation like this, CALP is not directly responsible for all of the administration and the logistics of the workshop, but we may either provide a trainer or link an organization with a trainer or contract with a, with a training partner organization to deliver that workshop, but that workshop would still be using the CALP uh, materials and thus it is, it is a CALP training and CALP certificates can be provided. Okay. Let me speak a little bit about a couple of things that I've mentioned there, the idea of a roster trainer uh, and uh, training partner organizations. Because CALP is committed to expanding uh, access to our capacity building workshops, we are going to expand the current roster of trainers that are available and that are endorsed by CALP to deliver a CALP training using CALP materials. Um, we are in the process of uh, making plans for, well, we will be holding a training of trainers for CALP personnel as well as members of the roster of trainers uh, in early February so that after that we'll be ready to roll out uh, CALP endorsed workshops just after that. A, CALP tr a training partner organization might be an organization that we would actually be contracting with, the, the, uh, having a licensing agreement that could then deliver uh, CALP trainings alongside its other packages. Different organizations that are that are offering courses uh, related to humanitarian the humanitarian sector uh, may be interested in delivering CALP workshops as well. So if their trainers are also trained, then they may be, may be licensed to, to access CALP materials in order to, to use those. So that would be another way that uh, a CALP affiliated training could be delivered. Right. Lastly, just to clarify uh, what we consider to be sort of non-CALP training workshops. And, and those are workshops that are uh, implemented independently from CALP, even if they're using CALP materials, uh, but they're typically delivered either neither by CALP staff nor a roster trainer. Or oftentimes that might be when an organization takes CALP materials and have, makes significant adaptations to them. Uh, such that they, they've moved away from at least the template of CALP uh, uh, the CALP materials, in which case then CALP isn't necessarily comfortable to endorse those materials as CALP materials, and in which case, while we might request um, acknowledgement of the source of the materials, we would not necessarily feel comfortable allowing the, the um, distribution of CALP certificates uh, with that type of a workshop. Okay. Um, let me speak a little bit about TOT and the, the question that came up before in terms of TOT for organizations in-house capacity. As many of you may be familiar, in the past, uh, CALP responded to and acknowledged that organizations are very interested in building in-house capacity to train staff within the organization. And that's what we uh, uh, carried out training of trainers workshops for. We, we will do that in the future. Right now, as we're trying to expand our reach, the focus of our TOT activities is on CALP staff, the roster trainers, and training partner organizations. 
That said, once we do that, we will be uh, supporting organizations and responding to organizations' requests to carry out TOTs for their in-house staff. That type of uh, TOT is particularly focused towards uh, CALP member organizations, but it doesn't necessarily need to be CALP member organizations as well. And they will have access then to the materials. Once those training of trainers have happened, they'll have access to training materials for, for delivery as well. Again, within the sort of framework of uh, adaptation, limits on adaptation. The, the term that we use is contextualization is something that we are comfortable with. Often that has to do with country contextualization or um, language contextualization, photographs, things along those lines of the materials. But um, adaptations uh, that might move us away from the, the, the heart of the, the materials are things that we, we will be monitoring a little bit more. So that's, that's the general rollout delivery mechanisms. Um, as I mentioned, we're in the process of uh, finalizing the uh, training of trainers that will be happening in February, which means we'll be ready to actually be rolling out workshops and the delivery of these materials uh, in the coming months. We'll be doing those in two different ways. One is for CALP to be scheduling uh, public open access workshops, as we've done in the past. And the second is to be responding to uh, particular requests from organizations, but now using the new materials rather than the, the level two materials that have been the core for those types of responses so far. Um, in some cases, we will be working with organizations to connect them with roster trainers rather than CALP doing the delivery. But in other cases, we will be uh, doing the delivery ourselves. So we encourage you to be in touch with the, the regional office within your region to, uh, to express interest and priority in terms of uh, training needs. And you'll see at the end of our presentation today, we have a link to an open survey that's been out for about a week and a half that I hope that many of you have had a chance to see and complete that gives us an idea of what priorities you might all have for scheduling some of our, our rollout activities. Okay. Let me check and see if there's any questions or Steph, you might step in if there's any questions that I could need to respond to. Yes, um, Martin, while you're reading the questions, maybe I could just add one thing, which is that um, because it will take us a while to translate these new materials into French and or other languages, the likelihood is for 2017, we'll start to roll out the new materials in our English-speaking countries, but for West Africa in particular, we may, you may continue continue to see level two advertised, at least for the first part of this year, while we're translating the new materials. So just to be clear, although we are starting now from February to start rolling out our new materials most of the time, you will still see occasionally level twos being advertised while we're waiting for the translations to catch up. Um, and maybe Martin, then I'll hand back over to you for some more questions. Okay, thanks Steph. Uh, I'm actually having a little bit of trouble scrolling. Aha, there we go. Okay, I see there was a question about uh, training of trainers. Uh, if you've gone through a training of trainers in the past with the old materials, we would still like to include you in a training of trainers for the new materials before we're comfortable uh, handing over the materials. As Steph said, noted, there, there's uh, not only updates in content, but especially with the, the technical, uh, there's a new presentation structure, and obviously the operations material is, is a new approach as well, so we would like to have our, our trainers be trained in that. Um, I'm having trouble scrolling. Steph, are there other questions that you can see there that I need to get yes, to? Maybe I, maybe I can read them out for you, Martin. That might help. Thanks. Um, Thank there was you. a question from Glenn about will the, material, will the new materials be open source? Yeah. At, at, at this point, we are committed to making our materials as open as possible. We're exploring opportunities of how that might be part of the CALP member benefits package in terms of the, the full details of materials. But overall, CALP remains committed to materials being available uh, to the community of practice. 
Great, thanks. And then a couple of quick questions. Dana was asking which re regional office covers the CAR, and Dana, that's our West Africa office. So for, for CAR, again, it would probably be French-speaking, so we would probably continue with level two until we have a French translation of the new materials to roll out. Um, Martin, could you maybe ask, answer Halla's question about what is the process to become a training partner organization with CALP? Mm, okay. Um, you could reach out to us, and, and what we're doing is, both at the, the global and the regional level, we're trying to canvas potential training partner organizations that, that uh, exist at, at the regional level or at the global level, and then we'll be having a process of, of uh, working with them to develop working with a number of them to develop letters of understanding or of agreement for licensing of materials. So certainly I, I would encourage you to reach out to us and I think you can expect that CALP will be reaching out with an advertisement encouraging organizations to contact us. Great, thanks Martin. And, uh, and just to, Debbie, oh sorry, go on. Just to add on to that again to reiterate the idea that the, the trainers that would be used by a training partner organization would also need to participate in a TOT. Great. And then just to answer Debbie's question, yes, there will be uh, more TOTs for roster members after the February one. So if, if any of you are roster members who didn't manage to make the one, the upcoming one in February, we are planning to do a, a couple more later in the year and we'll, we'll keep in touch with the roster members about that. And we're hoping to, to, to do the TOTs perhaps at regional level rather than just at global level. Yeah. Uh, and then there's a final question from Frederick on market analysis, I think. Can you, are you able to see that one, Martin? Um, no, I'm not. Let me see if I can okay. scroll. I'll read it out. In case an organization wishes to train its internal staff on market analysis, how should they go about this? Um... And Cal can CALP provide a trainer? Uh, yes, CALP could provide a trainer, yes. So to me, that, that would be an example of an organization reaching out to CALP with a specific request. So we could then link that organization with a roster member who is able to deliver training in that, or CALP staff may deliver training in that. So I'd encourage you to reach out to us. Okay, great. Right. Okay. I know we're going to have an opportunity for, for further questions, uh, and there may be some that come up, but perhaps at this point, uh, Steph, we can, we can move on to talking about CALP's new learning hub and uh, the learning management system. Sure. Yes, and I think maybe um, we'll, we'll go through some of these other questions and open up opportunities exactly for people to ask questions at the end. So I'll uh, skip ahead to our new learning hub. I wanted to first just uh, go back a step. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, some of our training materials have been developed in conjunction with other partners. Um, so for example, the introduction to markets analysis was developed uh, as a lead by IRC, but with support from CALP. Similarly, the operations training, one of our core trainings, was developed by the Fritz Institute with support from CALP. And so, um, there's quite a lot of inputs where we're trying to make sure that we have uh, key inputs from key specialists on different subjects. There's also a one of the specialized training is on cash and protection that was developed in conjunction with uh, the Women's Refugee Commission and UNHCR. Um, so a lot of our courses have been developed kind of with CALP support but also by other agencies. We are now entering into a new partnership uh, for an online learning hub, um, which I'm going to talk about now. So CALP has entered into a partnership with the Humanitarian Leadership Academy. Um, our partnership over the, over, over the coming years will be focused on a number of elements. Uh, so one aspect will be developing new training materials together. In the future, uh, the, the academy will also be setting up some training hubs around the world, um, global learning centers. So we may be partnering with them potentially on training delivery in the future. We may also work together possibly on elements of certification. And as part of that, uh, the Humanitarian Leadership Academy is going to be hosting um, a range of our online training and our learning pathways. So I'm just quickly going to give you, here we are, the next slide. So the, the Academy's uh, learning platform is called Kaya. 
and it is a free global learning platform for the humanitarian sector. It's uh, similar in a lot of ways to Disaster Ready, if some of you may be more familiar with that platform. Um, and we are going to be developing effectively a CALP space within Kaya um, in order so that, so that we can not only place our e-learning, but also to have these uh, structured learning pathways so that learners can track their progress through a pathway um, and that information will be recorded on the system. It will also hopefully help us to streamline our application and registration processes through that system. Uh, so, for example, if you wanted to apply for one of our core courses, we would be able to see in that system if you've already completed those prerequisites or taken the tests. So that kind of information would then appear for us to be able to very quickly see where people are at. Um, we're also hoping that in this learning hub, another option would be to allow people to self-assess against the competencies in our competence framework. So there would be an option for people to be sorted into one of those three participant groups that we mentioned, and then within that, to self-assess yourself against those competencies. And that's something that you could do over time to see where you feel your skills need work, direct you to courses. If there are some competencies you feel aren't very strong that you'd like to work on, we'll be able to signpost you to which courses would most effectively help you to achieve those competencies, but also uh, to allow you to see your own progress over time at building your cash skills. So we're hoping that this will be uh, quite a significant hub and an area. Martin has kindly put the link there. Although CALP space is not available yet, uh, we plan to do a big launch of this space in June 2017, so in the next six months. There will be some CALP materials slowly going up on this platform, so I would encourage you to go there now and take a look around, register yourself. Um, and as we start to release new materials, such as the new fundamentals, we'll make sure that we direct people there so you can see where it is. Um, and access some of those materials before June. So some things will be available uh, previously and some won't. Um, so I think that's uh, everything on our partnership with the Humanitarian Leadership Academy. The last thing before we open up for questions is to let you guys know that we are also in the process of developing our training calendar for 2017. So what this means is that we'd like to um, invite anyone and everyone around the world to fill in our survey, either in English or in French, and I'll ask Martin to add the links in the chat box for that. This is going to help us prioritize where we need to deliver our training this year so that we can see if there's a lot of requests coming, for example, from the CAR or from a particular country, we'll try to prioritize that training, but also to see which of our specialized trainings people are most interested in so we can prioritize uh, our time and the time of our roster members as well. Um, so I would really encourage you to fill in that survey. It will help us to see where training is needed and which training courses are most uh, in demand right now so that we can plan a training calendar for delivery and rollout of 2017 that hopefully meets that your needs as best we can. <laughs> um, and again, the, the link we shared previously uh, relating to our course catalog, if you go onto the website, you'll see uh, a list of all of our courses. And let me just put the link up. You'll be able to see all of our courses here um, and short descriptions of what they're all about. So that should help you to see the range of new materials CALP now has on offer. Um, that, oh, thanks. That's great. So Martin's just posted the link to the English survey and the, um, the French one. And so I think that brings us to the end. Let's open up the space for questions, because I'm aware there were quite a lot of questions. And we'll, I'll maybe ask Giselle, would you be able to enable people's microphones in case people would like to ask questions? Or otherwise, please type your questions into the chat box, and we'll try to, uh, to answer them as much as we can. Um, Martin, is there anything else you'd like to add before we hand over for questions? No, no, thanks. I'd like to invite people to speak or, as you say, to contribute uh, via the chat. Okay, Martin, there's a great question about our institutional capacity building program. Maybe could you elaborate a bit on that for Jamina? So the, the uh, strengthening institutional capacity building program 
is really a, a means of going beyond just the use of the organizational capacity assessment tool. And what we do there is we've articulated out a whole process of facilitating the use of that tool, which means uh, adapting the tool to the organization. It means gathering data uh, for the organization to take a look at itself, and then it's uh, convening a meeting to uh, analyze that data and think about, well, what does that mean for our organization in terms of where we are and where we want to be, and that culminates in the articulation of an action plan for that organization to be able to uh, take some uh, concrete steps to improving uh, their institutional capacity. Uh, at this point, there's there's different ways that CALP could be considering how that process would be facilitated, whether we do that using CALP staff or whether we are able to connect organizations with um, uh, experts in organizational change and organizational development that might be able to support an organization uh, or a combination of, of the two. So we've been in the process of uh, refining the OCAT that was initially developed about a year ago uh, and uh, to develop the whole process and we've been piloting it with organizations both in Europe and in North America and so we will ultimately be uh, ready to make that available to the community of practice within the coming months. Martin, I'm just going to respond maybe to Nicholas's question about the uh, Middle Eastern office. Um, so Nicholas is asking, when do we expect this to be functional and start hosting trainings? We are hoping to start planning some trainings extremely soon in the Middle East. Um, we have not yet posted anything onto our website, uh, but we should be planning and arranging rollout uh, for the Middle East very soon, and I would anticipate that we would be able to start delivering training from possibly March or April. I, we hope. Um, we do. So we'll, we we'll do have an in on our website. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a, a. We do have an interim regional representative that is now based in Amman that is helping to get things started for us there. Great. Um, Jamina is asking: Is there any available report or capitalization on this aspect of respecting confidentiality of organizations? I think that's relating to the institutionalization. Jamina, are you aware of our OCAT tool, which is the, the tool we currently have for uh, assessing organizations? What, what I would suggest of Jamina, and it looks like Aslam, uh, or, oh yeah, for Jamina, would be to reach out to, to myself or to Charity Lukea, who is the uh, senior Institutional Capacity Building Officer uh, for CALP. And you can get our email addresses, or we can put those email addresses in, and I encourage you to contact us directly. Um, Aslam, also for the um, private sector, why don't we have a conversation at some point? You can reach out to me and we can have a conversation. I, I, I'm sensitive to, to your input. It's useful. And then, Martin, could you also respond to Ju's question? She's asking, what will the re regional learning fora look like? Okay. Um, I'm not sure if any of our uh, regional uh, representatives or regional focal points are, are on the call right now. But in the past, the regional learning fora have been an opportunity where CALP has convened uh, practitioners from, from within the region to discuss whatever burning issues might be coming up in terms of cash transfer delivery and, and programming. So those are usually opportunities to, to uh, invite people from organizations, field practitioners, as well as host governments and things along those lines for usually one day of discussion. Um, it's primarily an information sharing, but there's certainly times where it might have a capacity building component, but we see that as really strengthening uh, organizations that are operating in the field. Yes, and I think just to add on to that, um, we, we sporadically organize regional learning events, um, which are usually one or two days, and focus on a particular thematic area of interest to that uh, regional group. Um, so it may be related to, for example, social protection or coordination of cash, um, or one of those many, many topics that come up and that a particular community practice is very interested in. 
I, I see that uh, Natalie Sissoko, our regional representative in West Africa, is here. So maybe, Natalie, you can share a bit of the experience of how you've set up regional learning for in the past. Natalie's mic on. Natalie has her microphone pulled. I think some of, there's been some problems with some of the participants uh, enabling their mics, so um, that may be something that we could continue the discussion later. Right. I see that it's approaching 9 o'clock and we want okay. to be open. Are there any other questions? Perhaps not. In which in, in which case, uh, I think we might go ahead and, and wrap up. But uh, again, I would encourage you to, to follow through some of those links. Take a look at our, our course catalog, the theory of change, and the competence framework that that are underlining uh, our work. And I invite you to reach out to both us at the global level as well as the regional offices to uh, to help think about how you can participate in capacity building workshops in the future. Great. And um, Karen, thank you for your last question. Um, we will be sharing the recording from today. Uh, we'll probably be posting it most likely to our YouTube channel, and we can share the link via the D group if that's helpful, um, so that anybody who missed it will be able to, to listen to the presentation. Um, and I'm also going to ask myself and Martin are going to put our own email addresses in the chat box so that if anybody has further questions or would like to have a follow-up chat, uh, we can make sure we arrange that. Right. And